everyone acknowledges, I think, that this passage is a difficult passage to understand. The passage in question is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 2 to 16. There are a couple of things that will help us to understand this passage that that I'll mention up front. The first is that we must remember that the Apostle Paul is still answering questions put to him by the Corinthian church in a letter of which we read in verse 1 of chapter 7 where he writes concerning the things of which you wrote to me and then he goes on to answer a series of questions. Well I think he is still answering questions and the importance of that is that an answer is always shaped by the question. For example if I ask you what the time is you will look at your watch and you will say 25 minutes past two. You will not then go on to explain what time is and discuss the philosophy of time. I didn't ask that and so you're not giving me a dissertation on the meaning of time. And so it is here when Paul answers a question he doesn't necessarily explore the entire topic and because we do not have the questions we do not have a copy of that letter the Corinthians sent to him uh, there is always the possibility that in answering a question uh, he will not deal with things he would deal with if he was uttering revelation from God on that particular issue. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is a peculiarity about this passage because it begins in verse 2 with traditions and it ends in verse 16 with practices or customs. Verse 16, but if anyone seems to be contentious we have no such customs nor do the churches of God. So the whole passage is sandwiched between traditions and customs and that is most unusual because traditions and customs are not fixed, they vary from age to age and from society to society. They vary with the culture, they vary with the language and so we are forewarned I think by this passage (coughs) that some of what is here falls into the category of traditions and customs but some of it falls into the category of revealed theology and one of the tasks we have is to disentangle those two things. Well I'm going to deal with the passage under four headings. First is roles not rank and the word role is R-O-L-E as in role model. And the second heading is relational not random. Now you won't understand these headings until we actually get to them relational not random. The third heading is symbols not substance and the fourth heading liberty not license. I hope all will become clear as we proceed. You see this passage has often been interpreted and I would say misinterpreted as teaching that women are inferior men and there are many societies of course that actually practice that belief. Uh, Islam, the religion of Islam is one clear example but is that actually what it teaches? So let's just look at these first verses 2 and 3 of chapter 11, the first two verses of our passage. Now I praise you brethren that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions that I delivered to you. But I want you to know 
that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So let's pursue this false idea that this verse is teaching that women are inferior to men. Well, the first thing we're told <clears throat> is this, the head of every man is Christ. So man is inferior to Christ. Well, of course he is. We know that. We accept that. The head of woman is man. And that's the contentious statement. Don't leave it on one side for a moment. And then the head of Christ is God. Now, does that mean that Christ is inferior to God? Well, the answer, of course, is absolutely not. A Christ and God, Christ and God the Father, I think we must understand here, Christ and God the Father are co-equal. They are of the same essence. Both in different parts of Scripture are called Yahweh, the familiar name of God. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks of himself as God. Show us the Father, Philip asked in John chapter 14. Show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus replies, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Why do you then say, show us the Father? If I leave that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And again and again and again, we are told that Christ is a person of a united Godhead, a united Trinity in which each of the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are co-equal. They are all God. So what is the difference? The difference is and lies in their role. It isn't a question of superiority and inferiority being discussed in this verse. It's a question of roles, functions. The three persons of the Godhead are co-equal. They are all eternal. They are all of the same essence. But they do have different functions within the Trinity. And that role difference is typified by one word, and that is obedience. Christ is and was obedient to the Father. And we can prove that in a number of ways. First of all, in that well-known verse, John 3, chapter 3, and verse 16, and we're told that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that those who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent his son. Now if you send somebody and they go, their going is an act of obedience. We're not told that God asked Christ to come into the world. Uh, we don't read that uh, God suggested to Christ that he comes into the world. No, he sent his son. And Christ again on at numerous occasions speaks of the Father who sent me. So Christ's role was the role of obeying the Father. And in John's Gospel we have a number of statements. I can do nothing of myself, he said. The Father tells me what to do, does the works. The words that I speak are not on my own authority. But as the Father speaks, so I speak. The Lord Jesus was obedient, totally obedient to God the Father. And that demonstrates the difference of roles. But you see, this 
obedience is not passive. It's not being a doormat to God the Father. In fact, the obedience is so active and so powerful that it can be boiled down to this statement that everything that God wants to do and wills to do in the universe and in his dealings with his creation, everything is done by Christ. The Father wills, the Son obeys by performing the will of God. And so we find if we read through scripture that Christ is the one who created all things. We find he is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. We find that he is the one uh, through whom revelation has been made to us. It's the spirit of Christ who was in the Old Testament prophets, Peter tells us, as they wrote those Old Testament scriptures. Redemption is performed by Christ. God wills to save a great number that no man can calculate. But it is Christ that does the work, that fulfills the work of redemption. And in John chapter 5, again we are told that the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. Christ is the judge of all men. And he is the giver of eternal life. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and I give to them eternal life. So Christ is the executive, if you like, of the triune God. It's not a passive obedience. It is an active obedience, an active fulfillment of that which God the Father wills. And now if we apply that to the whole verse, then we get a very different picture. We're not talking about inferiority. We're talking about obedience. Man is to be obedient to Christ. That is God's ideal. That is his purpose. Woman is to be obedient to man. And we'll come to more of that in a moment. That is God's purpose. But you see, man and woman are of the same essence. That's the whole point of the creation story, that Eve was not created separately from Adam, but was taken out of the side. The word is side, not rib. Taken out of the side of Adam. And he then declared, she is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She's of the same essence, the absolute same essence, just as Christ is as the same essence of God. But she has a role, and that role is to be obedient to man. And so we're talking here about roles, not ranks. We're not ranking man above woman. We're simply saying they have different roles in the economy of God. Now, the next point <clears throat> arises from that, relational, not random. So, woman is to be obedient to man, okay? So when I'm standing in the supermarket queue, I can turn around to the lady behind me, who's a complete stranger, and I say, well, you're supposed to be obedient to me, so you'll pay for my shopping. I suspect she will call for security rather, rather than uh, allow me to get away with that. That's utter nonsense. It's not random. I can't go up to any woman and say, the Bible teaches that you have to be obedient to me, so whatever I say, you've got to do. And the key here is something that is not always understood and appreciated that the Greek word for woman is exactly the same as the Greek word for wife. Exactly the same. You can't tell any difference between a woman and a wife except from the context in which that word is used. 
And when a couple marry, the wife pledges obedience to the husband, willingly, actively recognizing that there is to be an order of roles in that relationship. And I think that is the only way that woman can be obedient to man by being a willing wife. Of course, the old uh, marriage service always used to have the bride say that she would love, cherish and obey her husband. But nevertheless, the obedience we're talking about here of women to man is a relational obedience, a willing obedience, recognizing that the woman can be the best possible wife by being obedient to her husband. Now, Paul does uh, ameliorate that statement, doesn't he? Uh, for he says in verses 10 to 12, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as the woman came from man, they're of the same essence, even so also comes man through woman, they're of the same essence utter equality in the sight of God, but different roles. So let's then come to this question of head coverings. Verse 10, for this reason the woman ought to have authority on her head. The words a symbol of are not in the original, but I think they're properly inserted by the translators because that's what having authority on her head means, the symbol. It is a symbol of authority. And so let's go back and revisit the opening verse, or particularly verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. They're talking about a church meeting. It's a meeting of believers and it is a meeting in which praying and prophesying is taking place. Let me also just emphasize that prophecy in the New Testament times was not preaching. Prophecy was speaking direct revelation from God. It was necessary for there to be prophets in every church because the apostles couldn't be in every church. And God gave every church prophets whose work was to receive directly from God apostolic truth and relay it to the congregation. So that was prophecy, and of course it was no longer necessary once the New Testament was complete. But when there wasn't a New Testament in the early church, there had to be some way of conveying New Testament, New Covenant truth to those who assemble in the name of Christ. That was done by the prophets. So we're not here talking about women preachers. There was a meeting of the church and in that meeting nobody prohibited women from participating. Now, down the ages many churches have said women must keep silent in church. That's what Paul teaches in 1 Timothy. But I think they misunderstand what Paul is teaching there, and we don't have time really to explore it. His reply is, let the women keep silent in church, and when they get home, ask their husbands the question that they would have shouted out in the congregation. It's a particular kind of interruption. There's no prohibition here of women praying in public and prophesying in public, although we don't need that prophecy today. Once again, churches of the ages have, have said, no, women mustn't pray in the church at all. They're praying and prophesying with no kind of prohibition, except that the wives, 
those who are wives, should have this symbol of obedience, head covering of some kind, on her head in order to acknowledge symbolically the obedience to her husband that is in her heart. That is an opportunity when the church is gathered together for her to do that. Now the symbol doesn't produce the obedience and the removal of the symbol wouldn't remove the obedience. The obedience is something of the heart, the heart and the mind. The symbol is only a sign. Now we do not, as many churches used to do, insist that women wear hats in church. That's a, again a misreading of this instruction. The symbol means nothing. It's the substance that matters. It is the fact of the obedience. But how do you show the obedience except by a symbol? Well, I've got a wedding ring there. That's a symbol. My wife has got a wedding ring. It's a symbol. They're symbols of a relationship. And symbols can change. Change from culture to culture, from age to age. So whilst I have nothing against people who, who say that uh, wives, incidentally, must wear coverings or headscarves or something on their head, if they want to do that, that's fine by me, but it's not a necessity. The important is, is the heart submissive of a wife to a husband? This was an opportunity for the wives present in that meeting to confess and to rejoice in their relationship with their husband. I am a married woman, that's what he's saying, and I rejoice in my role as a married woman. I cannot see, quite honestly, how this could possibly apply to an unmarried woman. She has no particular man to whom to submit. She, along with every member of that meeting, male or female, have to be obedient to the Lord. But there's no question of her being obedient to some man who's sitting next to her, perhaps, unless he is her husband. So then I hope that clarifies that point. Symbols are not the substance. Man looks upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. Symbols are employed, but they don't have to be a particular kind of symbol. They don't even have to be a symbol. Because taking away the symbol does not change the obedience of the heart. And of course, another point which we have to gather from this account, as it were, of the church meeting, is that it is while the woman is praying or prophesying that they are to have their heads covered. When they leave that meeting, they don't have to keep their heads covered. This is restricted to the prayer and prophecy. Once they leave that meeting, once they go about their normal business day by day, there's absolutely no question, in this passage at least, of them having to be submissive or to demonstrate a submission. In fact, by wearing wedding rings, we probably go further than Paul is telling people to go here, because we wear those all the time. And, and those religions which insist, which is mainly Islam, but they're not the only one, that insist upon women uh, covering their heads all the time in public is, um, is not taught here and it's not a Christian doctrine or teaching. Well then finally we come to what is perhaps the most difficult passage of all and that is in verses 13 to 16. Let me just read them again as they are in the New King James Bible and in almost every Bible in English. A judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If the woman has 
long hair as a covering. Why did she need to cover her head in the meeting? There's a contradiction here, isn't there? Contradiction between one is saying that that a woman has to cover her head with some symbol of authority and then two verses later she's being told that uh, no need because she's got a covering already, it's her hair. Well, I think the whole problem arises from a misunderstanding of this verse or these verses. In verse 14 we read, <clears throat> does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair and so on? I think that is, it, it's a possible correct translation. I'm not questioning the, uh, the translator's um, skills in translating a language, but it is not the only way to translate that opening phrase. The word not is much more frequently translated in the New Testament as neither. And if we translate not as it is more frequently translated elsewhere as neither, it reads neither does nature itself teach that a man, if a man has long hair, it is a dishonour to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for it is given to her as a covering. Paul here, I believe, is actually denying a theory that has been put forward by the Corinthians or by some at Corinth. And the word custom used in verse 16 is... A philosophical word, it means a collective ethos. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a compound word. Sun means together, along with, and ethos is exactly the same word in English. It's a together ethos. It's a collective ethos. And Paul is saying we don't have any such collective ethos in the churches. And what I think he is doing is picking up something they have said in the letter in which either the writers of the letter or others in the church who are causing them worry and contention, you see, he says, if any man contention, that's in verse 15, I'm sorry, it's in verse 16. If anyone seems to be contentious, there are some in Corinth who were contending with denying the traditions that Paul has imparted to them right back in the early part of the passage. And they are replacing Paul's tradition teaching with a new theory. And that theory is that nature teaches short hair, good for a man, long hair, good for a woman. It's a philosophical view of this whole business of hair. And Paul is saying, look, You've got this philosophical idea. Remember that Corinth was a centre of Greek philosophy. You've got this philosophical idea that nature, that is the natural course of events, the natural world, teaches us something that Revelation does not teach us. It teaches us that there is this distinction. Short hair good for men, long hair good for women. Long hair a covering for women. Not at all, said Paul. That, that's a philosophical theory, and I am saying that it's not true. Neither does nature teach us these things. 
So set aside your philosophical theories. I am here answering a question and I'm saying this is not true because the churches of God do not have such a custom. And that's the only way I can make sense of these closing verses of the passage. And I think it actually does, does us quite a favour because it teaches us that it is all too easy for, for cultural and philosophical ideas to creep into a church and displace good theology. Because we're seeing all that happening today in our own land with the various teachings of uh, trans, trans um, identity in terms of, of, of sexuality. Trans people are claiming that they are neither men nor women, or perhaps that being born a man, they have become a woman. And this, this is a philosophical concept doing tremendous damage in the churches, splitting churches, causing great trouble, great contention. Uh, and there are other ideas of a quite different nature that seep into the church that come from the world around that are not consistent with the revelation of Scripture. And so Paul is here putting down a philosophical concept that completely muddies the water as far as the meaning of headship is concerned. Headship is a role. One is head, another is obedient to that head. That's a role issue. Not a superiority, inferiority issue at all. It is a role issue chosen deliberately and willingly and gladly and happily by those women who enter into a marriage. Nothing more. Well, we've sort of struggled through that passage and uh, I, I hope that it has, in fact, stimulated thought for you and uh, answered some questions perhaps. But we'll leave it there and sing our closing hymn which is 794.